Welcome to Lesson 3F, Constitutive Equation for Newtonian Fluid. In this lesson, we'll define the constitutive equation and generate it for a Newtonian fluid. On the way, we'll define a deviatoric stress tensor and introduce the so-called second coefficient of viscosity. Finally, we'll simplify this constitutive equation for an incompressible Newtonian fluid. We start with Cauchy's equation, the general differential equation for linear momentum. This equation is valid for any fluid, Newtonian or non-Newtonian, compressible or incompressible, even for deforming solids. The problem is this term, Tij, the stress tensor. Tij is not only unknown, but it's not one of our primary variables. Recall for the general case, we have the velocity vector, pressure, density, and temperature, which are our six primary unknowns or variables in the problem. Therefore, our goal is to express the stress tensor in terms of these six primary unknowns and fluid properties like viscosity. If we can accomplish that, then Cauchy's equation will become much more usable. This leads us to what we call the constitutive equation, which we'll define as any equation that expresses Tij as a function of the primary unknowns and fluid properties. As mentioned up here in the title, We'll do this only for a Newtonian fluid. As a review, let's define a Newtonian fluid. For a Newtonian fluid, stress is a linear function of strain rate. Examples include the most common fluids, water and air, oil, etc. Non-Newtonian fluids are fluids where the stress is a non-linear function of strain rate, and also fluids with memory. For example, viscoelastic fluids, also polymer solutions, blood, cake batter, etc. So let's derive the constitutive equation for Newtonian fluids. Historically, this was first done by Stokes in 1845. Navier actually died in 1836, but we take what Navier did combined with what Stokes did to form the famous Navier-Stokes equation. Stokes made three assumptions about Newtonian fluids. First, Tij is at most a linear function of strain rate. Recall Sij was defined previously as the strain rate tensor. This is analogous to Hooke's law for a spring, an ideal spring, where linear strain produces linear stress. Number two, the fluid is isotropic. This means that fluid properties are independent of direction. This is true for most fluids. Here's an example of a non-isotropic fluid, slurries with oblong particles. These long particles tend to align with the flow. So there's kind of a grain in the flow, like the grain of a piece of wood. And this kind of fluid will behave differently in one direction than another. But we're going to talk only about isotropic flows. Mathematically, the stress strain relationship must be independent of rotation of coordinate axes. Let's highlight these first two laws and we'll apply them to get our constitutive equation. Number three is a little simpler. When the strain rate tensor Sij is zero, which means there's no motion, in other words the fluid is at rest and not deforming, it's just sitting there at rest. Only normal stresses can exist. In other words there can be no shear stresses. At rest, therefore, Tij must reduce to negative P delta Ij when strain rate tensor Sij is zero. This is the mathematical way of expressing Stokes' third assumption. What we're saying is that the only stress is pressure. There are only normal hydrostatic pressure stresses. If this is a little fluid element, we can have pressure acting on the surfaces, but you can see that these are all normal stresses. There are no shear stresses when the flow is stationary. One of the first statements in my fluid mechanics book is that a fluid is a substance that continuously deforms upon application of a shear stress. In other words, as soon as you add a shear stress to this fluid particle, it will move and deform and therefore cannot tolerate a shear stress while it is stationary. Another way of saying this is that a fluid at rest cannot resist a shear stress. Why not? If a shear stress is applied, it will continuously deform. It cannot resist a shear stress. 
Let's now use Stokes' three assumptions to generate our constitutive equation. First, let's define the deviatoric stress tensor. We'll call it tau ij. We'll define it as the component of stress tensor tij due to fluid motion. In other words, we want to remove the effect of pressure. So tij is equal to negative p delta ij plus this so-called deviatoric stress tensor, tau ij. I'll label these terms. This is the total stress. This is the hydrostatic stress that's always there, even when the fluid is at rest. And this is the deviatoric stress due to fluid motion. Total stress is equal to these two parts. When the fluid is at rest, Sij is zero, which, as we'll find out, that means tau Ij is zero. And therefore, Tij is equal to negative P delta Ij. This statement satisfies Stokes' third assumption so now all we have to deal with is the other two assumptions to find our constitutive equation. Let's look at assumption one more closely. Tau ij is linearly proportional to Sij. And recall, we defined the strain rate tensor as one half del ui del xj plus del uj del xi in tensor notation. Well, what does this mean mathematically? It means that each component of tau ij is at most a linear combination of each component of the strain rate. Well, how many components are we talking about? Tau Ij has nine components, since it's a second order tensor, and Sij also has nine components. So we conclude that there are nine times nine, or 81, possible combinations. Mathematically, we would write tau 1, 1 equals some coefficient k1111 s11 plus k1112 s12 plus nine of such terms ending with k1133 s33. There are nine terms for deviatoric stress tensor component tau11. Similarly, tau12 would be k1211 s11 plus k1212 s12, etc. Also nine terms. We can see if we keep doing this, there are 81 coefficients. This is where tensor notation comes in really handy. We can rewrite this entire equation in one simple tensor notation equation, namely tau ij is coefficient k i j m n s m n. This is the most general linear equation between tau ij and s ij, or in this case s m n. The problem here is that this is a fourth order tensor with 81 components. I had a hard enough time understanding second order tensors, and now you're giving us fourth order tensors. I think I'm going to be sick. Calm down, Ned. It won't be as hard as you think. How do we find all 81 of these coefficients? Well, that's where assumption number two comes in, which is that the fluid is isotropic. In other words, the equation for tau ij, or constitutive equation for the deviatoric part, must be independent of coordinate rotation. No matter what coordinate system we use, we need to get the same result. It can be shown that this is possible only if our coefficient tensor, kijmn, is itself isotropic. As an aside, delta ij, the Kronecker delta function, is the only second order isotropic tensor. Similarly, epsilon ijk, the alternating or permutation tensor, is the only third order isotropic tensor. What about fourth order? It turns out that the only isotropic fourth order tensor is one of the form kijmn equals some coefficient lambda delta ij delta mn plus some other coefficient mu delta im delta jn plus a third coefficient gamma, delta in, delta jm. These coefficients, lambda, mu, and gamma, are arbitrary scalars. So no matter what their values, this equation represents an isotropic fourth order tensor. These three scalars are not necessarily constants. They can depend on the thermodynamic state, for example. In other words, they can be functions of rho, p, and t.
Well, what does this equation do for us? Well, recall that k had 81 coefficients, since it's a fourth order tensor. We've reduced the 81 coefficients to three coefficients, lambda, mu, and gamma. Or we can say, out of the original 81 coefficients, we are down to only three. This makes our life much easier. That's a lot better. Thank you, sir. One more argument that's not really part of Stokes' assumptions, but we've mentioned before that Tij is symmetric. Therefore, tau ij, the deviatoric part, must also be symmetric. So in our equation, tau ij is kij mn s mn. This kij mn must be symmetric in indices i and j. Mathematically, kij mn must equal kji mn. But if we look up at this equation, we see that that's possible only if gamma and mu are the same. I write that here. It's possible only if gamma equal mu. Now we can rewrite this equation by plugging in this equation with gamma equal mu. The result is tau ij equal 2 mu delta im delta jn smn plus lambda delta ij delta mn smn. Now let's do some fancy contractions with tensor notation. This grouping of terms is non-zero only when i equal m. So we can rewrite this as delta j n s i n. But this is non-zero only when j equal n. So this reduces to s i j. Similarly, these two terms are non-zero only when m equal n. And we sum over all m and all n, since both of them are repeated indices. So this reduces to s m m. Plugging those in, tau ij is 2 mu sij plus lambda smm delta ij. This is thus our deviatoric stress tensor for a Newtonian fluid. Finally, the full stress tensor was negative p delta ij plus the deviatoric part tau ij. So finally, we have tij is negative p delta ij plus 2 mu sij plus lambda smn delta ij. This is now our constitutive equation for a Newtonian fluid. Notice that we've gone from 81 original coefficients now to 2, mu and lambda. Now let's not forget our goal. We wanted to write tij in terms of the primary variables. Here's pressure, but we need to substitute the equation for sij in order to complete this task. Well, again, Sij, the strain rate tensor, is 1 half del ui del xj plus del uj del xi. And I just realized this should be an m rather than an n. And smm is summed over these indices, making these two terms the same and the half goes away. So smm is del um del xm, or the divergence of velocity. This coefficient mu is the coefficient of viscosity in general, a function of temperature and pressure, or of temperature and density. Any two thermodynamic properties are sufficient to give mu. But what is lambda, this coefficient? Lambda is called the second coefficient of viscosity, also a thermodynamic variable or property. Mu is well known in undergraduate fluid mechanics, but lambda is rarely even mentioned. Fortunately, lambda is rarely important except in highly compressible flows. Plugging these equations for S into our constitutive equation, we can write Tij equal negative P delta Ij plus mu del Ui del Xj plus del Uj del Xi plus lambda del Um del Xm delta Ij. This is the compressible stress tensor for a Newtonian fluid. As discussed previously, if the flow is incompressible, this term goes away, so lambda does not even enter the picture. I should mention that Stokes had a fourth assumption, namely that lambda is minus two-thirds mu. If you work through the math, this causes lambda to drop out of the equation. So this is not really based on physics, but just to make the equation easier. Other authors introduce mu v as a bulk viscosity, which they define as lambda plus two-thirds mu. 
so that when lambda is minus two-thirds mu, it goes away. Most of our work will be incompressible. For incompressible flow, del um del xm equals zero. Therefore, this equation becomes tij equal negative p delta ij plus mu del ui del xj plus del uj del xi, or plus two mu sij. This is the incompressible stress tensor for Newtonian fluids. This is the form we'll use most often, and we have achieved our goal of obtaining a constitutive equation. In the next lesson, we'll plug this in to our linear momentum equation to generate the famous Navier-Stokes equation. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel for more videos.